evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're live again tonight. This is June the 1st in 2012. I don't know what happened to May, but it has evaporated on us. And now we are in June, where the whole first six months evaporated, I think. Uh, We can't keep up with what uh, month anyway because we travel so much. But here we are in June. Okay. And let me give out the toll-free number first before we bring our guest on. The toll-free number, in case anyone wants to call in, is 1-888-627-6008. 888-627-6008. And that number is good all over the world. Anybody who wants to call in and ask questions. But I would like it if you would keep the questions to our what our guest is going to be talking about. Okay, uh, I think after the last two weeks now, what I've been doing, you know, we are getting ready for our seventh transformation conference that's going to be going on in July. I give her the dates again. July 13th to the 15th in Rogers, Arkansas. Uh, they're full-day conferences, and we have all the information about them on our website at ozarkmt.com. That's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T.com. Just follow all the links to the conference, and you'll get everything you need. Okay, because we are really trying to gear up for that now and getting ready for it. It takes a lot of work to put one of these on. This is our seventh year, and for the last two weeks, I have been having as my guests our new authors, and the ones that are going to be speakers at our conference. So we can try to let them get their feet wet with doing interviews and getting ready for the conference. So our guest tonight is Janie Wells, and she's we're talking to her. She's just outside of Nashville. And she's the author of a new book. It's just only been out a month or so, hasn't it? If that long. <laughs> yeah, it's a new, totally new book. It just came off the press. Mm-hmm. And her book is called Payment for Passage. And we're going to be interviewing Jane and Janie and talking about her experience. It may be something that the rest of you can identify with, but I hope not because it is one of those very heartbreaking experiences that takes an awful lot of courage to face and a great deal of perseverance to come out of this hole, really. Because there is, you can react to these circumstances so many different ways. But we chose to publish her book because I think it shows the way she has dealt with her problems. And and she wants to share this with everyone else. Tell a little bit about it, I guess. Then, Well, we guess we can let Janie tell what it is, but... Um, it's it's a, something that I hope a lot of parents would never, ever have to face. But jo- Janie has done it and has proved herself a survivor. Okay, Janie, you're there, aren't you? Yes, I am. Good evening. Okay, don't go away on me here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I usually like to start with the guests telling about themselves. And then we'll get into the book. I was going to say something about it, but I think we'll let you do it because you're the expert on what you wrote about the book's payment for passage. Janie, tell us about yourself, your background. Well, I uh, grew up in Nashville and at a very young age uh, had a lot of questions about why we're down here and what's life all about. And uh, so from a very early age, I began to search spiritually. And I didn't know that's what I was doing, but uh, nothing ever satisfied me. I wanted to know a little bit more about why people were the way they were and why I was interacting with them the way I was. And I always wanted to learn something from them. So this really uh, propelled me into... Uh, being probably a very uh, positive person, one of the most positive people and spiritual people I knew uh, eventually uh, because I just believed anything was possible. And um, I got a job as a webmaster. I've been a teacher um, all of my professional life in one way or another, and um, 
but I became a single parent with a 12 and 13 year old son and daughter. So when I moved into the Franklin area, I quit teaching and coaching and wanted just to get an office job uh, so I could spend more time with them. And it ended up that I got the first computer in the Williamson County School System and learned how to use uh-huh. it back in 90 and uh, started teaching teachers how. So I started teaching again, which was my love. So um, I tried to raise my children. I wanted to set an example that there was always a loving thread in everything that happened and that nothing went unnoticed. Um, and, and there wasn't anything that you couldn't learn from. And that love always prevailed. And, you know, that didn't mean I certainly had my feelings and uh, would get sad and angry and we would have our times together and all of that. But there was an underlying thread in our relationships that there was a loving God and that, you know, the only people we can control was ourselves and to try to make the world a better place. So that sets me up for 2001. Um, In 2001, my daughter was 30, and my son was 31. And uh, Joanne had, um, she graduated from Vanderbilt as a nurse practitioner, and she took a job in Blue Ridge, Georgia, because it was an underserved community. So after two years, she became the primary physician for over 3,000 patients. And she was just a remarkable human being. And and my best friend, uh, along with my son, but we hiked the Grand Tetons together and um, just enjoyed each other, enjoyed life, and we're very grateful for the life that we led. Well, in 2001, 9-11, with the horrible loss and bombing, uh, in the United States, and um, I remember Joanne, she called me and she said, Mom, do we need to be worried about uh, terrorists overseas? And my response to her still haunts me some because I said, no, you know, actually the only thing we've got any worry about or joy with or anything to learn from is what is immediately around us. Well, mm-hmm. on October 7th, um, we bombed overseas um, uh, because of 9-11 and uh, tightened security on the borders, which turned out to be why we caught the man that uh, that murdered my daughter. And um, I was in a hotel that Sunday evening. I was in a hotel room by myself, and I got the phone call that Joanne was deceased. And in that moment... Um, everything I knew, everything I felt was gone. And it wasn't like I made a conscious decision that I was mad at God or anything like that. I just, t- it was like somebody turned the light switch off in my room and I couldn't see anything. Nothing was familiar. I didn't know where I was. Um, all I could do was just think of the next thing to do and I just dropped to my knees and started screaming. But uh, I was in Chattanooga, not too far from her cabin. So when my son called, I hysterically told him, and bless his heart, he didn't know whether I was going to make it traveling over the mountains into the, to Blue Ridge, Georgia. But he um, he prepared to come also, he and his wife, Beth. So in that moment, um, I became very disoriented and actually didn't know where I was. And I ran out into the parking lot. All I could think about was getting to my daughter's cabin and giving her a hug. I just didn't want them to move the body till I could hug her. And um, I was I was frantic. And the first of my angelic encounters took place. Um, I came later to uh, understand. But I, I wasn't sure where I was, and I couldn't even remember where the car was. So this man comes up to me and he says, can I help you? And I told him what had happened, and I said, I've got to find the interstate so I can go to uh, the Okoe River. Excuse me. And um, he said, you follow me, and I will take you there. And he took me to the interstate and uh, got me on the road going to the Okoe. 
And I turned around to look back to wave and thank him, and he was not there. <laughs> there was nothing there. <laughs> Definitely an angel. <laughs> yes. So I got to the uh, to her cabin. She lived up on top of a mountain, and um, she she and I were going to build a wellness center out west. And she wanted to live there to empower herself, and she wanted so much to uh, give women and children and anybody for that matter. She just loved people, choices, and um, a, a power to uh, enjoy life and and love life and and feel that they were important and. So she knew that she had to do that for herself first, and that's why she was living there. And um, I topped the hill and saw her uh, cabin, and there were police cars and tapes all over. And that was the first time that I realized that it, it, it was a crime. <laughs> I guess I thought she'd had a heart attack. I don't know. But anyway, that's when I really lost reality um, because I knew I'd never hug her again. And... Um, what what was so riveting to me was on the way to uh, the cabin, I was asking Joanne for help. There was no longer a, a loving God in my life or a loving being of any kind, and I was begging Joanne to help me through this. And um, so two days later, uh, we made it through the crime scene and um, and all, and two days Later, they released the cabin so that we could get some clothes to bury her in. So uh, I drove back, and uh, before her funeral, they did capture the man. He was, as I said, they had tightened the borders, and he was in her vehicle. He had just gotten out of federal prison. She didn't know him. We didn't know him. Uh, but he came to live with his mother in that community, and he'd been out of prison for about three or four weeks. And, he was a total um, stranger. A total stranger. She had no idea he existed. And um, so one of the things that I began to wonder was, um, is everything I told my children and I believed wrong? You know, what is more powerful, love or evil? Here she was living this loving, caring path, and this man was breeding evil right down the road, and we didn't even know they existed. So at that point, um, it was probably the beginning of the darkest time in my whole life because I had lost contact with any loving spiritual power at all, and it just totally became me against the world. <laughs> and that's a very dark place to be. So at the funeral, there's several turning points in my life, and at the funeral... Um, I, the, right the day that we were going to uh, bury her, um, I had pulled my chair up to the coffin and got there early, and I was looking at her, and and I heard these two women behind me, and one said, this has got to be the most uh, hardest lesson in faith there is for any human being. And something just, it was the first coherent thought I had um, since I'd heard about her death, and I thought, I'm at a crossroads here, and I'm either going to have to be a woman of fear and anger or a woman of faith. And, you know, there's a certain moment in between a horrific uh, experience in your life and a decision that hadn't been made yet. And I, I just truly believe that's when divine intervention can take place and inner wisdom can come in if you'll just let it. And... I looked up at my son, and there was no doubt I was going to have to become a woman, a woman of faith, um, because I loved him very much. And so um, I began to try to build on that, but was just uh, so totally disoriented. And, and I had so much to do. I, I was working, and I was also having to get her estate settled and get things together for the crime, for the the trial. Um, and um, I, I could barely remember what I did five minutes ago. So I began to write down notes of what just happened and how I felt. And I ended up with a shoebox <laughs> of experiences uh, the next three years. And I did it for two reasons. I had been in recovery enough and spiritual workshops and all to know that 
if you don't handle a feeling at the time that you're experiencing it, it's going to come back to get you. And if you ever want to recover from it, uh, you need to be in the moment with it and relive it in a different way. And so that I did know that much. So I started writing down what was happening and how I felt. And I also need to remember what to do next and what I had just done. So that became very valuable when I started writing the book. Because um, the first intent for the book was uh, to keep my, my daughter's memory alive in the beautiful way she lived and not in the horrific way she died. Um, she was uh, raped and tortured and a mother's worst <laughs> nightmare. But I wanted her to, to be remembered um, for who she was. And uh, later as I started writing that book, she corrected me. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I sat and I looked at the computer and I just couldn't think of anything. I didn't even know what I believed anymore. And I realized I was the soul that was missing in action, not her. And I just I just couldn't. I, I knew the title of the, the book. I had gotten that in a psychiatrist's office. I had misunderstood something he said. And I said, did you say payment for passage? And he said, well, no, nothing like it. And I said, well, I'm supposed to remember that for some reason. And so that I knew was the title of the book later on. But I couldn't figure out what it meant, what exactly I was going to write about it and associate about it with Joanne. And so I sat there and for two or three days with just a blank computer. And finally I asked for help, which I have learned is the best way to get started on anything <laughs> if you can't do it yourself. And mm-hmm. um, I just said, Joanne, please help me. And all of a sudden, I can tell when I'm communicating with something higher and more precious than I am, um, the spiritual realm, because when I'm talking to you, I'm thinking and I'm talking and I barely remember what I've said in five seconds because I'm very much in the moment. But when I'm kind of channeling or hearing, I'm listening. It's like I'm hearing it at the same time you're hearing it, uh, what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and I know then that it's Joanne or something higher that, that's using me to, and I can only do that when I'm totally in the moment and focused on the person or myself Um that I'm trying to relate to and communicate with. But anyway, um, I, I was I was writing, writing, trying to write, and I couldn't, and I asked John for help, and I'll never forget these words. I started typing underneath the, the title. Mom, just start typing with no reasoning, no judgment, and no expectations. If you write the book with faith and no plan of what the book should say, you're going to learn the meaning of your life. You'll have all the encouragement, wisdom, and guidance you need as you find this meaning for yourself. If a company publishes your book and keeps my memory alive, that's wonderful. But the first intent of this book must be your own healing. As your love for yourself grows during your healing, your truth will ripple into the lives of others in many ways, and the book may be one of them. Wow. So the purpose for my book changed. <laughs> and, and and also, as I started, when I got to, um, it was kind of like I was emotionally vomiting. I've got to be honest with you, when I first started doing it, it was like I picked up my shoebox and everything, but all that had to come out. And so I just I just typed and typed and typed and let anything come out. And um, and finally I got to, uh, and the shoebox came in handy because as I was typing what happened, I could be in the moment. I had written down exactly in the moment what had happened and how I felt. Mm-hmm. But I was, I was typing from the focus of payment for passage. This is all I, that you have to give up and all I had to lose in order to go to, to live here on earth. And that's why I was having such a struggle, because that wasn't the meaning of the title at all. When I got to Chapter 8, and the chapter where my daughter came to me and helped me with that chapter and communicated with me, 
I knew that the payment for passage were the gifts and the wisdom you receive by finishing your journey out here on earth. Yeah. And from that point on, the book was effortless. I don't want to talk the whole time. If you've got any questions, please let no, me know. No, you're, you're doing terrific. That's why I'm thinking mm-hmm. people want to hear it from yourself. But, you know, one thing I do want to bring up, uh, you know, on TV, when they always show these uh, the murder trials and everything, the trials are done very fast. But yes. you said the trials went on for years, didn't they? Yes. Um, and you had to be there every single day for years listening to the same horrible story over and over again. But yes. Just say uh, something about they're not fast, are they? No, they're not. Um, he was captured in 2001, and the trial finally took place in um, 2004. And in between there, there were hearings. Um, you go through hearings where they decide uh, what evidence can be um, given at the trial. Um, and so, um, you know, it seemed like once a month I was going uh, and sitting in the room with this man. Um, but I want to tell you this. The first time I saw, and I'm not going to ever mention his name because uh, it was brought out in the trial that his purpose in life was to rape, rob, pillage, and become famous. Uh, and so that's why in my book. You don't you know, want him to be famous, that's for sure. No, no, no. No, so that's why you won't ever know his name. But um, if you're savvy on the Internet, by the information I'm giving, you can find out. But I'm not going to say it. But anyway. That's a good, idea, good idea. Let's leave it like that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, he, he's 6'9", and uh, black belt and karate. And he, mm-hmm. um, he was in her home when Joanne entered her house. And uh, he, she, he shot a sawed-off shotgun in the ceiling to disorient her. And they're not even really sure what exactly was the final blow that killed her. He, he did so much. But all of that was just wearing on me, and I'd wake up screaming at night and all. But the first thing, the first time that, that my family saw him was at the arraignment where they actually charged him. And... When he walked in that courtroom, I I was just at total peace. Uh, something came over me and just surrounded me, and I was watching everything going on, and I was just at total peace. Mm. And that's when I got another message uh, from my daughter. And she said, Mom, this is how it was when he killed me. Hmm. I was protected. Uh-huh. And he was, you know, evilly in pain, anybody that evil is. But she said, I was okay. I was protected. So uh, I needed that. <laughs> but anyway. I uh, you would. That, maybe that would made it a little easier if you knew she wasn't going through experiencing all of it. She'd removed yes. herself from it anyway. Yes, yes, hmm. and um, and that's where I was screaming at yourself from being in the same room with him. Yes, I mean, and I people. later went through. I'm sorry, I later went through some recovery work where I had to go through the moments that scared me the most about it, and um, and I finally got to. I couldn't enter my house without shaking to death because he had been in her home. And um, I had to go through some extensive treatment uh, to try to get out from under some of that fear and pain, which, you know, uh, definitely I would say that, you know, um, medical assistance and, and help is needed <laughs> when you go through something mm-hmm. like this. But I, I finally got to the point where I was okay uh, and could feel some peace about it. But uh, we went through three years of hearings about what could be admissible and what couldn't. And um, at that time, I was a recovering alcoholic, and I had 20 years sobriety. And um, one hearing after three years uh, was they were trying to, uh, his defense lawyers were wanting to make sure that he didn't suffer if, if he got the death penalty, that he would just go to sleep and wouldn't suffer any pain. And he wouldn't suffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
after I snapped. You know, mm-hmm. I, I just lost, I lost all my resolve, and I just snapped. And um, on the way home, I, I drove from Georgia to Nashville, and on the way home, I just stopped and, and got got a bottle of uh, alcohol. And at first, it felt like an old friend. You know, I, reality kind of left me, and I wasn't in pain anymore. But the one thing I want to say about that is um, it took me back to the gates of hell that I'd been in before. <laughs> It did not solve any mm-hmm. problems, and um, so uh, thank, thanks to my son, uh, I, I went back in and got some help for that. And uh, today, I've got seven more years, so uh, okay. I'm very pleased with that. Wonderful, you know. I yeah. think this is important for people listening out there too to know you can slide back whenever you're faced with such a catastrophe. But then you came out of it again. Yes. And you know, you can learn. I, I, in, in my case, I learned a lot, even through pain and anger and fear. And nothing is wasted in your life. There, there are no times, even if you're angry or in pain or fear or relapsing or whatever, nothing is wasted as long as you've got loving intent in your heart. And I was making some mistakes. I wasn't doing some really wise things. But as long as I had loving intent in my heart, I was being carried by uh, a loving spirit. You, you were just being human, that's all. Yes. And um, and, and I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the things that I went through, um, and, and it, one of the most important things that I want to uh, get out with the book is being in the moment and being yourself. You know, I realized at a certain point that if I just lived in fear and wasn't myself and hid and closed up my heart, I just I didn't exist. You know, I was taking up space on this earth, but I didn't exist. And uh, I truly believe uh, that, yeah. <clears throat> You know that that you got to come back to keep learning. If you don't learn it one time, and I was not going to come back. <laughs> I had made up my really? mind. Yeah, and Julie said he would have killed you too in that respect. You know. Yes, yes, he would have, because I realized if, if you're not if, if you're not at home in your body and you're not spiritually alive and emotionally present and in the moment, you do not exist. You know, you're dead. No, you're, and like you said, you are. You're taking up space. Yeah, you're just taking up space. So, um, I one of the therapy things that I did, being in the moment, um, there was I've got a basement where my where I park my car, and there's a ledge, and uh, I went down one day, and there was a, I'm very terrified of snakes, and there was a snake in my basement. <laughs> And I just, I closed the doors, I put towels underneath to make sure nothing crawled out, I taped up all the pipes and everything else, and I actually had to hitchhike to get another car. I was not going to go down there and get that car. So finally I paid somebody to come. (laughs) No. So finally I paid somebody to come take everything out of my uh, basement and uh, we, you know, we made sure that snake was gone so I could start functioning again. Well, I went to a hearing in Georgia, and it was one of those hearings where, you know, the poor guy, we wanted to make sure he didn't suffer. And I came back home, and I felt like, at that point, I think I was feeling like we were victims of evil and victims of men like that, that that evil was more powerful. And um, so I went downstairs after that, and that snake was there again. Uh Oh, it was the cheapest therapy I've ever had. I said, oh, no, you don't. And I got a snow shovel, and I chopped that thing to pieces. Oh. I, <laughs> that was the cheapest oh, and best therapy I think I'd had up to that point. <laughs> that's so, why the um, snake's there, and that's why you weren't supposed to get him out. That's out right. Out the basement. That's oh, right. He, he served was, a purpose. He was going to come and... You know, and I learned then too. Even snakes can help you heal. You know, mm-hmm. um, there's 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 certain people in my life where I think, why have I got to deal with this? <clears throat> why have I got to deal with them? Why is this? A-? They're all teachers. You know, 
they always bring me to the place where I want to be. And so I've learned to cherish anyone that crosses my path. And um, so anyway, I got, getting back to the book <laughs> real quick, when I pulled out my shoebox and I started seeing the pieces and parts and typing out everything that came to me, after I read it and reread it and relived it and relived it, all of a sudden I could kind of see it from a distance and it started falling together. And it started showing me its purpose and its path and its journey, all the different things that happened. And I like to call that shoebox my uh, soul puzzle because mm-hmm. it was just pieces of my life. And finally, when I got the puzzle together, I saw where I was going. So that's a very, very good shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, but I want to say this, um, I still, even after I talked to my daughter in, in my bedroom one time, which is chapter eight, and she talked to me more than I talked to her, um, I, I was, I was questioning myself, what is, what is a human life worth? You know, what, why are we down here? What is it worth? And is evil really more powerful? And my son got me riding a bicycle, and I love it. I'll ride 10, 20 miles a day, and I just, it's when I can be me totally in the moment, and I'm not anybody. I'm not a mother, I'm not an employee or anybody. And I really would like to uh, encourage anybody to find something like that for themselves. It's, it's the best getting in the moment thing that I can do. But my phone rang while I was on my bike, and it was you. Oh, me? Oh, you was on the bike when yes. I called you? It, yes, <laughs> you called me on my cell phone. And you uh-huh. said, Janie, I'm really interested in your book. I think you have a good book. And Dolores, in that moment, you answered my question. Love is more powerful than evil. Oh. <laughs> hmm. And Joanne is her stories out there now, and her life is out there. Hmm. And so you answered well, that for but, me. T- t- tell us what happened to the man. What were the results of the trial? Okay, um, there was. Uh, that's beautiful. Well, I want to move the story. Well, on. and I we're kept, sitting here ready yeah, to cry. Maybe so that. you bring us in tears more than anybody I know. All these emails you keep sending us, we cry with all of them, and it's like oh. enough. Come on. So that's why oh. I'm, I'm uh, moving yeah. it on. Anyway. Yeah, we're sitting here about to cry. <laughs> okay. Oh, but, well, um, I've got to. I've got to tell you too. What happened to you the know, man? What was the trial? Okay. Um, and I don't want to forget how my relationship with y'all has been a spiritual experience in itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to address that, what's been going on. <laughs> no, well, it's, uh, it's a because true story. Because so stop us at the top of the yeah. hour. That's why I want to get as yeah. much in as I can here. But go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, he is on death row in Terre Haute, Indiana. He's on federal death row. And um, he he's on his fourth appeal. Well, there's two appeals, and he's on the fourth round. Which is the uh, and and they've been denied and so it could be four or five more years, but um, the next thing it goes to a panel of federal judges and if it's denied there, it goes to Supreme Court. If it's denied there, then he writes a letter of clemency to the president, and if the president denies it, then they set an execution date. And many people have asked me if I want revenge out of this and you know i've learned forgiveness i don't understand i don't know the definition of letting go is what's worked for me um, yeah, yeah. I, I you know i don't i don't wish harm on him anymore any more than he's done to himself and he chose right. this mm-hmm. uh i can let him go he doesn't dominate my day anymore my my loving yeah. daughter that's, and my son and and, it's been it 11 be years. I didn't realize it would take that long, but then the trial took so long to come. To That's the justice yeah. system. It's that it's long. not fast. Mm. <laughs> it's the just, yeah, it's the just. You know, Jenny, well, there's death- one part of the book that I really loved. I'm, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I read it. It's when you, uh, uh, she finally began to get contact with you, and you kept asking her, yeah. I want to hear, hear you. 
And it was like all of a sudden she began to talk to you, and you said something about, well, where where were you? I, I wanted to know you were all right. And she says, I've always been here. I've never left yeah. you. Yeah. Um, just, I, I, you always, so I talked deep. to her. I'm sorry? No, but ahead. I said you were so deep into your uh, sorrow that you didn't realize yeah. she'd always been there. No, I didn't. I, that's the hard. You know, the mother part of me, I guess it's that part in yourselves, just can't imagine your child in any other form. And so I really had a hard time with that. And so I looked in a, at, a, at a picture every morning, though, and I'd say, well, Joe, if you're here, I'm still here. Please help me. And one time, one one morning, that one-way conversation turned into a multi-dimensional spiritual experience. And I felt a peace again, and I, and she said, I, I didn't come that night to tell you goodbye when, when I came and gave you some peace. She said, I came to tell you that I'm still with you, even if you had to bury my body. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, after I finally realized it was her and I wasn't, in, I wasn't crazy, <laughs> um, I finally said, Joanne, where, where are you and why is it taking you so long? And, she said, I've always been here with you. And uh, she said, loss is just a human perception. And I know it's been very hard for you to go let go at the new level that you're working on, but she said, you're really doing a good job, Mom, a really good job. And I just broke into tears because mm-hmm. that's what I came to tell you today, and that's what I needed to hear from her. Mm-hmm. But and when she goes we get on so to, caught up in that, we can't hear. You have to right. get moments peace before it can come through. That's right. And that's what she says. You know, she's, she, she told me a lot of really neat things. But um, she said that, you know, a lot of people think that when you, when you go to a funeral that you hear going home and home and all of that. And she said, you know, you don't have to wait until you die to connect with the heavenly realm and feel that peace and know that you're part of a bigger thing. You just don't have to die to do that. And she's mm-hmm. carried me to that place. And um, and she definitely wanted me to make sure that people know that love is the only connection between spirits. Okay, yeah. But That's first, what we get all the time. Yeah. But, uh, Janie, I do want you to talk about the sundial. And oh, too, and we have some special built. guests listening in from South Africa right now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to bring up because the ones who made the sundial are in South Africa, and they said it's uh, one or two o'clock in the morning there, and they're listening in their bed. So let's talk about the sundial and center and everything, so that you can see how you know Joanne's number is progressed forward. They're breaking up a bit. Okay, you are you here now? Hello. Yes, I can. Okay, he said we're breaking up. I'll so talk. Let's just try to keep going anyway. But let's just talk about that because that's how her memory has in, kept going. Yes, um, her the patients and friends uh, made a collection, uh, took up some money, and wanted to have a memorial for her. And I had built an outdoor classroom for her. She took out an insurance policy two months before she died, which was unbelievable. And I wondered what she wanted me to do with it. And I built an outdoor classroom in her memory. And the, her patients and friends wanted to give her a memorial uh, for that, and so I wanted to get her a sundial. And I found one on the Internet that I loved. It's a noon cannon sundial. It had a cannon on it. It was really cool. And so um, I sent um, emails to I, – I Googled and found all these sundial makers all over the world. And I sent it to like uh, 48, 50 sundial makers. And all of them said they couldn't do it but one. And Malcolm Barnfield in South Africa emailed me, and he said, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so he told me exactly how he could do it and exactly how he could make it. And we just really connected uh, and with his wife, Charlie. And so um, after we communicated back and forth, I gave him, kind of gave him clear reins of, of making it, and but we kept communicating, and he needed to know several details so that the sundial would be 
set exactly for where we were going to put it in the um, uh, in the classroom. And um, so I got an email one morning, and it said, "Janie, uh, my wife and I would we're we're concerned about the tenor of your voice, and uh, we'd like for you to come to South Africa and pick up your sundial." And there was no thought on my part. I, I thought, I'm going to do this. And so um, I took the money. Instead of them having to pay to ship it, I took the money and I flew over there and spent a week with them. And that was the first time that, um, and they are listening now, hi, Tosh, hi, Charlie. Uh, the first time since all this had happened, I was in a, a totally new place. They didn't know me. And it was like I was just free to be who I was. I didn't have to prove anything. There was no expectations. And that's where I really learned to live in the moment, was in South Africa. And so I brought the sundial over, and it's in its place, and it's absolutely wonderful. Did I leave anything out you wanted to hear? Okay, Janie, are you there? Yes, I can hear you now. You faded out on me. I know. I apologize to the listeners. The little gremlins were at work again on the telephone lines, and we were cut off. But we still got 10 minutes. Let's go with this. Uh, I think you were talking about the sundial in the center, and then uh, we lost on this end. Yeah, we don't know how far you got in your story. So Uh, Go ahead and tell that story. and. Okay. Well, the main thing was I went to uh, South Africa to get the sundial, and that was the first time since uh, Joanne's death that I was able to to just be me and had nothing to prove, no expectations, and it was the perfect time for me to learn to be in the moment as me and how wonderful that felt. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was one of the biggest gifts I got in South Africa. Well, oh, t- talk about the center. That was you did a lot with that in Joanne's memory, didn't you? Uh, yes, she uh, she took out an insurance policy and had me as the beneficiary, and so I took the money uh, and built an outdoor classroom. And it's a thousand square foot classroom out in nature. Uh, it's in the shape of a gazebo, and it's got a stage and. Um, there's been uh, thousands and thousands of children come through there for classes, but it's also served as kind of a meditation center for people to come and just kind of get their thoughts together. And um, there was, there's been seven or eight weddings, <laughs> so uh, it's just been a multi-useful uh, place, and uh, and it's called Joanne's Outdoor Classroom. So mm. it's uh, it's still the, uh, center located. It's located in Fairview, Tennessee, oh, uh, okay. and if you um, if you Google Joanne's Outdoor Classroom, you'll see the directions exactly how to get to it. And also, on um, the Saturday before Christmas every year, I had a hard time putting a Christmas tree up again because Joanne and I enjoyed it so much together, but I decided to put one down at the classroom that first Christmas after it was built, and uh, and then I also... I uh, realized that there were other people that were missing loved ones, and so uh, I invited the whole community to come put um, an ornament in, in memory of someone on that tree, and it's become a, a beautiful thing every year. But the first year uh, I was there with someone, and uh, it was almost New Year's Day, and I was kind of crying and very sad about all the souls that weren't with us anymore, and all of a sudden I felt this nudge, and I turned around, and there was a doe looking me right in the face. <laughs> and the person with me took the picture, and it was just like, you know, they were telling me they were still with me, and not to be sad. Mm-hmm, because deer don't do that. <laughs> no, they don't. And there's a picture in the book of it, us nose to, to nose. <laughs> there's also that. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you... Yeah, we're here. Are you involved with the center? Uh, yes, I. Uh, well, 
I, I've given it to uh, the city to run and so forth, but anytime I'm requested to be there or there's any uh, special event there, I go. And I always like to go down and just sit and be there, you know. But it's not like I'm uh, the director or anything like that. It's it's definitely I gave it to the city of Fairview and the children of Fairview. Mm. Oh, I think that's a that's a wonderful way to uh, commemorate her. And it's something she would have been very proud of. That need to be well, remembered. Well, you know, we had a really case. we had, we had a really bad flood here a couple of years ago, and I was afraid to go down and see what might have happened to it. And I finally got up enough courage. And a week later, and when I was walking down there, I heard all these little children just laughing coming up the path. It's down in the woods, and um, and as they rounded the corner. One little girl came up to me, and she had a broken broom, and she said, we just cleaned out Joanne's classroom, and it's so clean and neat now. And see, I I, I swept so hard, I broke my broom. <laughs> and, you know, it's just events like that that just still warm my soul. Right. And yeah. then she said and Joanne I think would be. Ex- yeah. I think and I, I told Joanne would uh, she is proud of you, not that you will be proud of you. She is proud of you. And I think you're a wonderful example to everybody out there who is, has gone through some kind of a similar experience. But I do want to remind people uh, that Janie is going to be a speaker at our 7th Transformation Conference here in Rogers, and she's going to be able to ask her questions about all of this. And the name of the book is Payment for Passage. And you can either get it in the bookstores. She found it in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> that was <a> yes. Story. <laughs> oh, that was something. <laughs> and but if well, you I, can get it, you can and you or you can get it through us at our website. It, it, but it, it should be in the bookstores. It's payment for passage. But Janie, tell people how they can contact you if you want them to. Um, they can they can email me. The probably the best thing to do instead of trying to remember an email address is if they will just um, search for Joanne J O A N N Joanne's outdoor classroom. Then I've got a lot of information, uh, and there's a, a link there where you can email me, and there's information about the book. Um, I've just got all the information about this entire experience all in one place. I'm going to have a website just for the book pretty soon. But if they'll just uh, search for Joanne's Outdoor Classroom, then they'll they'll definitely find me. And I hope I have time. I've got to tell them about the cover, Dolores. Uh, Jamie, can, can you hear that noise? Uh, no, I can't. Okay, well, Joanne's with us, so um, but now, now, anyway, go ahead and tell your story because this will be great. But, yeah, Joanne's been here. Yeah, she, <laughs> she, I, there was a very loud noise on our end that was really, it was overshadowing what you were saying, but I think Don has probably worked it out. And Julie said that was Joanne. Well, was I wouldn't doubt it. I, yeah, it, that, it, it was, it, yeah, I know it was. <laughs> it was very well, loud, you, you know, electrical noise. She she does things, you know. Angels have their own unique way of communicating, and they really enjoy oh, the magical yeah. ways they but, do it. Uh, well, okay. yeah. Tell your story now before we have to go off the air. Okay, uh, I wrote nothing in the manuscript about redbirds. Not one thing about redbirds because it's a very personal thing for me. That that's how Joanne would come to me if I needed her assurance or special occasions. A redbird always comes. So I put nothing in the manuscript about that whatsoever. And uh, I had a cover for the book, but you said you wanted the artist to do one. So I thought, well, that'll be that'll be great. Let me see what an artist does after, you know, with the book. And so when I found it was on the Internet and I went and looked at the book, I could not believe that there is one very large red bird feather on the cover of that book. <laughs> And I emailed and, and I said, how in the world did, did you do that? And where did yeah. you get the thing? And y'all said, John, our artist, always listens to his intuition. And none of us knew why that red bird feather needed to be on that cover, but we knew it was right. 
Uh-huh. So thank you. It was. I, I was looking at it. It's like, okay, I don't know what, because a lot of times it's covers. I'm like, okay, I don't know what you mean here. I'm not sure what you're getting at, but, you know, on that one, it felt right. I didn't know yeah. why, but it felt right. And I'm like, okay, uh-huh. we're going with it. <laughs> so, okay. Well, it was, and then when you it was, that, it was like, oh, my. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but the one thing I wanted to make sure they got to that, where they're supposed to contact her because that's when she was being drowned out on our end. I don't know how it's coming across on the air, but give out the way to contact you again. Okay, if if you'll search for Joanne's Outdoor Classroom, J-O-A-N-N, then I've got my information and my email, a uh, link for my email and all of that. Okay. Now, that time she wasn't drowned out, so... Well, I was going to ask you, because well, we have like one minute. Yeah. <laughs> Does she have... Okay. Um, what kind of music did she like? What kind of music? I mean, uh, was there John a, Denver. a musical instrument? Pardon? Uh, she loved John Denver. And okay. In, oh, I, I should from... ask her if she's met John Denver. Ah. Well... <laughs> What I was wondering, because what the sound that was going on sounded like a musical instrument. It sounded like... Oh! A... What? I don't know if it was like... a guitar or a cello or something. Probably a cello. Okay. What did it, it sound like? It's been like a... Um, well, it's like a stringed instrument of some kind, like it a was, high... But the it high was very loud. Yeah. So, oh! So that was... Okay. The, I, okay. Okay. She bought a she bought a CD at uh, Black in Black Mountain for a workshop she was in, and I happened to go there two years after she died and stopped in that very same place and bought the very same CD, and I didn't know that she had bought it till I found it in her possessions, but it was it was a stringed instrument playing and it was called Homecoming. Mhm. And so okay. that's that came to me very directly when you said that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was it because it was very distinctly a musical instrument, and I was like, "That's her. It's not an electronic thing. It's Joanne." Mm-hmm. It was <laughs> very, mm-hmm. very loud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll have to see what the recording comes yeah, out of this yeah. show. What that right. sounds like. Right. Anyway, we we okay. were just given the panel. We have to pull the plug. Yeah, we got to so. <laughs> pull the plug. But we'll see you in in a few months. If no, we'll a few long. Weeks. Well, a few weeks. Okay, <laughs> won't be long now, Jenny. <laughs> All okay. Right. Thanks for coming on. And thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. Good night. Good night, everybody. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.